So uh, I work. I worked for IBM, and we launched this program together with other partners. So it's not just an IBM initiative. Initiative. Uh, it's in partnership with Linux Foundation, the United Nations Human Rights Office, and David Clark Cause, who's a fellow that helps rally eminent individuals uh, to raise awareness of important issues, uh, whether that's global health, uh, disaster response, or veterans' issues. So we have a great ecosystem of partners in Call for Code, and we, what we like to consider about Call for Code that sets it apart from other Tech for Good initiatives is that there is support for the top winning teams to deliver their solutions, uh, not only get recognized in the competition with a cash prize, but also to get mentorship so that their project can develop sustainable open source communities that are very vibrant, that have users and contributors from across the world. And so now that we've entered our fourth year of the global competition, uh, we've got some great technology to show you from past winners. And we also have uh, a whole bunch of other call for code solutions that are in various states of maturity, uh, either as a fail Linux foundation projects with the call for code umbrella or ones that are um, just rapidly innovating today uh, that you can observe and, and kind of keep tabs on for when we invite contributors to those projects. Uh, but we do have a bunch of them that cover all sorts of technology. So whether you're interested in artificial intelligence, internet of things, data science, web applications, serverless, mobile applications, uh, there's usually a problem area or a technology that can appeal to just about anybody who's interested in open source technology. Uh, so over the years, uh, we've had almost half a million developers take part either in the multi-month single yearly global competition or through some of our other initiatives together with the Linux Foundation and other partners to take on specific issues, uh, things that we call spot challenges. Um, and those are issues that arise outside the global competition. So if you are familiar with Call for Code, uh, you may have associated it with, with certain competitions, but be aware there's more to it than just that. And we've had participation from around the world, uh, 179 nations so far. And um, I don't think we can expand too, too much farther than that, but um, there are developers that are new to the competition, have been involved in the competition, um, and we're really excited to see that growing community, that international community, uh, which is a really key important thing about open source. Now, we did launch in 2018. Our focus then was on preparing, responding to, and recovering from disasters. Uh, mainly of the natural sort. Um, and we have over the years had other themes come through. Um, so some of the applications are focused on those areas, other focused on different um, challenges. But uh, the first year we focused on uh, natural disasters. Project Owl was the team that created an emergency mesh network, something that was cheap and easily deployable after a disaster, inspired by what happened in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, where some folks didn't have network connectivity restored until almost nine months later. Um, power, sometimes that's easier to get better and uh, back online easier, uh, but network communications after the fact, as well as during the emergency are very important to be done and to deploy that quickly in a way that um, folks can have access to that technology, very important. So Project Owl's technology was open sourced as the cluster duct protocol. And I'll talk about it a little bit more detail later. Uh, the following year's winner, Prometeo, um, they also took on a solution for uh, mitigating the effects of disasters, in particular, looking at wildlands firefighters that are battling wildfires in Spain, uh, in Australia, in Argentina, in the United States, in the United States and, and elsewhere around the world. Um, so we've been working with them also to bring their technology to the open source community at the Linux Foundation. And our third global challenge winner, uh, they won, uh, they were recognized uh, late last year, and we've been working with them to take their solution um, uh, to the open source community as well. So their solution um, was in response to the call for code global challenge prompt around climate change. So we, in the first couple of years, we looked at the symptom of disasters. And in the last couple of years, including this year, we focused more on climate change and the issues driving disasters. Last year was a very unique year. Uh, we had the pandemic, so we launched an additional track for the social and business aspects of the pandemic. How can you create technology for emergency communications, for community cooperation, remote education, social distancing? So, so another project there that was, was a, a great piece of innovation built on open source technology, including 
Cloud Foundry, uh, React Native for um, uh, targeting Android as well as iPhone devices, uh, was an application that's um, still under development and test, um, but it's out there if you've heard of it, it's available as a web application for anybody to use today. And that's, that's called SafeQ. Uh, also very important, starting last year, around this time, there was a large um, emphasis around how do we handle the impacts of racial injustice? Is there a way that technology can make a difference, can be used in such a way to drive more equality? So another program is Call for Code for Racial Justice. And within that program, we have seven open source projects uh, where folks can learn about a particular issue under one of three sub themes and, um, and look at ways that they can get involved in those communities as users of the technology um, or to contribute to them as well. Now, I mentioned earlier that what sets Call for Code apart is this idea that it's not just about putting a project prompt out there or um, inspiring people to go use technology to go win a competition. With Call for Code, there is the Global Challenge prize money, which I'll talk into a little bit um, more detail later. There is that uh, mentorship and best practices provided by the Linux Foundation. IBM assigns an IBM Service Corps, volunteers from the company across the world uh, who are experts in hardware, software, branding, marketing, logo design, user experience, all those sorts of things come together to support the top projects. And uh, eventually what they do is graduate out into some sort of sustainability, either as a startup that's built a business around technology, or if it's an NGO, a non-government organization, a nonprofit that is creating something core to their mission, or maybe it even becomes part of an enterprise um, company's product line, but it's based on open source. So the call for code competition is really about the idea creation. Uh, we also have a deployment framework, and this is where the Linux Foundation is incredibly important, is it helps us develop um, a, an ecosystem of partners who can help improve the technology, provide feedback, provide expertise. And we take it from um, being raw innovation at the competition period. We work it through uh, improving non-functional, functional requirements, making it easier to use, uh, considering different use cases. And we test it out in the field. In, in COVID, we actually did go to Puerto Rico with Project Dowl. Um, or uh, testing Prometeo with firefighters or uh, working with farmers in the case of Agrily. So it's very important that these projects are not only inspired to build amazing innovation, but before they're opened up to larger contributions from the open source community, that we validate the core uh, functionality of the project so that when we invite folks through the Linux Foundation model to take part, um, there's really clear ways to get involved and to deploy it um, on your own where you might want to have it take on a challenge in your own area. Um, and finally, implementation. So we have a lot of um, great teams out there that can give you kind of feedback on their experience as well as help you use that technology um, and mentor you in turn to create your amazing innovation on top of those open source projects. So I mentioned Call for Code. Um, IBM is the founding uh, partner, so we provide the technology. Uh, the United Nations and other UN organizations help us formulate the prompts, tie them back to sustainable goals. Um, but really, uh, the important part of Linux involvement here is if you go to linuxfoundation.org, um, look up the projects, you'll see that we have an umbrella. It's called Call for Code with Linux Foundation, um, easy enough. And you can see the current list of 12 projects that are neutrally hosted right now at the Linux Foundation. And by going to that page, you can dive into either the generic call for code Slack, uh, which has channels for each of the, the teams, uh, the, the, the supporting organizations behind these open source projects. Uh, and you can drive into the GitHub organization as well. So some of them are hosted under a call for code, um, I'm sorry, github.ibm.com slash call dash for dash code. Um, others have expanded out to include more repos. They're in different organizations. But if you go here, this is where you can learn about the ones that are official projects ready for contributors, as well as ones that are working through that maturity um, incubating uh, funnel right now. There is also a parallel organization uh, for the Call for Code for Racial Justice projects. 
Um, it has its a whole set of other related repositories, including links back to the CNCF's Inclusive Naming Initiative. Um, so you can learn about the technology there. We do also, as IBM, provide on our developer website a way to understand these projects in a little more depth. We've got videos, we've got interviews, uh, we've got other documentation where you can learn about the story of how these projects were created. And you can dive in and contribute to them in, um, in, in GitHub as well. And there are links in, in all of these repos to uh, Slack and also so you can see some of the licensing details. The Linux Foundation focuses on Apache 2. Um, so most of these are Apache 2 licensed, except where maybe they, they build upon additional data sets, things like that, that are differently licensed. Um, and whatever you don't find in, in GitHub, uh, we normally have something on IDM Developer that addresses one of three types of users of that open source technology. Uh, if you just want to learn about the technology, understand the issue, and potentially just um, consume it in your own context, such as understanding how a mesh network works, that you want to put one together, you want to build the skills and IoT to, to go do that yourself. Uh, we've got materials for that on IBM Developer. Um, you can learn about the specific projects and how you might get involved, uh, what, what they're trying to solve, what they're not trying to solve, and hands-on with the technology. And finally, uh, they all have contribution guidelines that adhere to the best practices from the Linux Foundation. So they include a code of conduct, uh, they include some details on how we handle pull requests, how we respond to issues, and who the technical steering committee members are behind each of the projects. So the decision makers who will guide them to the projects and contact to learn more about the project and potentially earn your way into committership in each of the projects. So now that you understand um, the, the general structure of what Call for Code is and, and some of the uh, ways that we handle the innovation, let me dive into a few of our specific examples of technology that's been generated by the competition, as well as things that have evolved since. So to do that, let me start with the first year's global challenge winner. Uh, it was a team that submitted for the challenge, which is focused on natural disasters. How do you prepare for, respond to, and recover from them? And what Project OWL did was they built a way to deploy really cheap IoT devices quickly, cheaply, throughout an area that's um, dealing with a natural disaster, something that can not replace infrastructure, or not the commercial projects that were out there beforehand, but things that provide a, a niche where they can comp and provide a quick solution. So um, this is not a major infrastructure for the internet. You're not gonna run broadband over their mesh network. Uh, it's not something that would take weeks to deploy such as a satellite uh, or a weather balloon um, sort of solution. And what they created was a set of self-assembling mesh nodes that use long range radio uh, to connect with themselves, assign their own roles in a mesh network, and which can be connected with solar and, um, um, sorry, it's solar and other sat activity, so that in case there is no infrastructure, they can still operate as their own uh, basic network. And what really sets this apart, too, in the context that they developed it, is it provides end users that they can access from a mobile device without having to download a specific app. Um, essentially what they've done that's really innovative is they take advantage of the built-in captive portal that is in mobile devices, that thing that prompts you to join um, that works at a hotel or, or at a coffee shop, things like that. And they use that, they provide their interface through that. Um, so instead of providing a password and details to join a network, you're actually doing on that to send information over it in a unique way. So they uh, they call for code. They open source their core mesh network technology as the cluster duck protocol. And as a startup, they continue to build software as a service around the dashboard for understanding the messages that are coming through the system, as well as how folks can best respond to that as a commander in a disaster. Uh, they've got some really great documentation put together now that they've built out their community from the innovation through to different ways to deploy different types of networks in different situations. Um, so you can learn a lot about 
what their naming is for the ducts that form different roles in the mesh network. You can learn how to run it on different types of hardware beyond just the ESP32 boards that they started with. Uh, and in fact, um, they've got some great stories too around some of the testing they've done. Um, long range radio has, has a certain terrestrial distance. It's affected by uh, things that radio is, concrete and humidity and altitude and topography. But they've done some really interesting stuff in terms of um, uh, merging this with satellite solutions by launching some weather balloons to do um, LoRa over really long distances up at, at certain levels of the atmosphere. So really a vibrant community, um, a great fit, a set of folks to get involved with. And people are using this technology in lots of different ways. Um, the students from California Polytechnic Institute are using it for uh, that, that upper atmosphere testing. Uh, you've got folks that are using it to manage their vineyards in California. And you've got folks obviously testing it and having ownership of the technology in Puerto Rico itself where it was originally developed. And um, setting them on this, this journey is that, that as a top call for code global challenge winner, we connected them with public and private partners in Puerto Rico. We based ourselves at one of the great innovation IoT labs there called Engine 4 and had them test their technology in various conditions that represented the hardest hit areas by Hurricane Maria. So testing on very humid um, beach conditions, dense concrete um, built up areas around San Juan, as well as in mountainous regions in the middle of the island, in Comarillo, where there's lots of valleys and they had the hardest challenges with network connectivity restoration and um, other areas around the island. And so they got through this testing process with folks that we assembled to help them. They continued to test their technology and um, test it in various uh, locations, as well as provide a way for stakeholders on the island to have an ownership stake in that tech to learn the skills to maintain or recreate these nodes. Um, and what's really a great story about this is there are students involved that are learning tech skills, IoT skills, open source um, technology, web application dashboard technology, uh, and also having ownership and a stake in this potentially life-saving technology. So there's about 30 nodes on the island today, uh, all continuing to emit back data, um, solar powered, uh, connect satellite, some of them, um, a way to test out the technology uh, for future incidents. Uh, let's see. And so if we look back at the, uh, the 2020 year in review, uh, there's been some great innovation this year as well in the Call for Code community around um, uh, Project Dowell. But uh, really, it's, it's about understanding um, from that announcement from their open source project last year to where they've grown, what they've done to refactor the technology with the help of the, with the open source community, uh, including making their network more reliable, making it more cool, as well as improving and uh, making more efficient their, their message format that they're sending along the network. So uh, really, uh, they're, they're really looking for additional developers to take it forward. You can learn about it at cluster.protocol.org, also the link from the Linux Foundation page, and uh, take a look at some of the open issues, uh, take a look at that documentation, and dive right into that community. I know one of the, um, the really uh, big things that they're looking to improve is how you can independently test this without necessarily having access to hardware. So for those interested in simulating M MQTT messages, uh, building Dockerized solutions, um, containerized solutions, those are definitely things that you could contribute to today. Okay, so let's look at um, the 2019 winner. Uh, this was a team of developers from Spain, uh, a team of five folks, that's the limit of, of people that can be on a team and, and call for code and working with the global challenge. Uh, it included a PhD engineer. She was accompanied by a data scientist a full stack and IoT developer, as well as a nurse and a firefighter um, within their team called Prometeo. So it showed that the open source community really benefits from the collaboration of people with all sorts of skills and experiences. Um, and that would help them be successful by identifying who the end user of their innovation was and being able to tell that story of why this technology was, was important, uh, why it hit a real need, and how it could be quickly adopted. Uh, particularly within that fire department in Spain. So their solution is, is based on Kubernetes. Uh, it is something that we're open sourcing um, very soon as a differently named project. Prometeo will be the startup, as all was, but the project will be mutually owned under a different name. And what they created was also IoT related. And what, what it did was when wildfires 
uh, firefighters go out into the field. Um, and normally they do much of their work actually during prescribed burns, controlled burns that are planned in advance. And so what they do is they select a piece of um, land in the Catalonia region of Spain. In this particular case, they determine uh, which 12 firefighters are going to go out there, uh, cross the borders, um, ensure that it's only contained to a certain area. Uh, they set fire with um, benzene, uh, gasoline canisters, and they, they control burns in the way it goes. But during this non-emergency situation, they're spending a lot of time exposed to chemicals carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, acrolein, the benzene from the fuel, formaldehyde, all sorts of other things that are burning uh, vegetation. And they normally track before, during, and after on paper. How is somebody feeling? Um, are they having headaches? Are they having shorts of breath? And it's always been a paper-based system. What this solution did was uh, create an innovative prototype that the firefighter wears, includes sensors, and could emit data in real time to someone in the field, in the tent, uh, to see the state of everybody's exposure that they may not even know themselves, how they're you know, really immediately affected by, affected by that chemical. And what we've done with the open source community is, is take it from there and with the team that was assembled around the world to help them, uh, hardware experts, data scientists, uh, folks that understand um, uh, Watson Health, for example, folks that understand long-term averages of exposure to chemicals, uh, as well as folks that help create a brand new user interface for the device, other folks that helped uh, go from the prototype board down to the soldered board, which sets them on the path to a new PCB, a, a fabricate board. Uh, and so we had a team for, of IBM from around the world, Argentina, United Arab Emirates, uh, the United States, um, and Spain themselves uh, take part in this, this initiative to bring the project to where it is in its current state. So uh, there's the device, uh, it now is offline first. Um, it caches information as well as captures averages over time, which are just as important as the real-time exposure of the firefighter. And earlier this year, they were able to take the latest version of their device um, and put it into a more self-enclosed unit, one that doesn't have exposed battery or wires as in the first prototype that won the competition. Uh, they've deployed everything to Kubernetes uh, everything is deployed and auto deployed from GitHub, and the documentation is, is being improved and, in general, um, uh, made, made more welcoming to the open source community. Um, and Samsung uh, was a partner in this. They, were, they lent some uh, watches and ruggedized devices to help drive two way communication back to the firefighters rather than collect the information. So, really great ecosystem building around this project. And um, we're really looking for contributors in the coming months to help drive it forward in terms of improving um, the hardware, adding more sensors, um, doing mold development, watch development, um, Samsung uh, based on Java or Kotlin, uh, web applications, I'm sorry, watch based on C++ or just web apps, um, and data science, Jupyter notebooks, things like that. So uh, really uh, looking for the community to grow around this project and bring it from where it is as that um, robust solution to somewhere where it can make a greater difference, not only in Spain, but elsewhere around the world. Um, so let's look at our final one. And as I mentioned, these projects come in, they're still pretty um, rough around the edges and it's usually limited to the team that created the technology, right? Some of them may not be as familiar with open source, but they're really good in you know, consuming open source technology, writing code, building apps, or they have some great experience on the ground with the problem domain. And what we try to do is bring them from that raw state through the incubation um, so that they can test the technology and it can be expanded around the world. That's, that's kind of the repeating pattern we have with all of our projects. So Agrily, uh, what they created for the Call for Code Challenge, which was focused on climate change last year, was an application that is able to combine a whole bunch of data, public data from NASA, as well as some of the weather company APIs around short-term forecasting digest that down into a way for a smallholder farmer um, based in Mongolia, Brazil, or India, which is where the team um, is from. They all met at Pace University in New York, though. Um, how a farmer can make use of this massive amount of data that is brought together and run through a set of uh, data science algorithms written in R to give them immediately actionable knowledge to start each day about what they should plant, when they should plant it, and what sort of considerations are out there in terms of precipitation or, or temperature. So a really amazing way to use modern technology behind the scenes 
and to bring that into a really crisp user interface for the ubiquitous Android devices that are available throughout emerging nations. Uh, they fortunately were also one of those teams that uh, had uh, a local um, audience to test their application with them. And uh, they provided uh, that immediate feedback during the competition. They tested with some small, uh, the farmers in Mongolia to start. And um, we continued to work with them using, um, after the competition, we, we, what we do with each team is understand their needs based on a design thinking approach. So understanding their end users in more detail, empathizing with what a small farmer has access to, uh, what the information they need, and then working back to develop a solution that can improve the outcomes for that farmer in an iterative way um, so that through the Agrily team startup their own company, uh, they can build a business model, they can expand around the world, and the open source community can still benefit from this core innovation, taking it in different directions, contributing it, maybe using it in other parts of the world where the Agrily team is not focused right now. So stick out, uh, stick, stick out, stay on the, um, the lookout for uh, news from this project, but uh, really, really great innovation there. And you can follow their story through a bunch of um, videos and updates we've had over the years, including at our recent Think Conference, uh, which targets IBM developers. Now, those were the top global challenge winners, um, but we do, as I mentioned, um, have a set of a bunch of other open source projects uh, that are in various states of maturity that we, uh, we invite you to look at. Uh, at a glance here, um, there is uh, Project Owl is the Cluster Duck Protocol one. We'll have the one for Prometeo under their new name soon. Um, and I'll mention OpenEW, Isaac Simo, and Liquid Prep in, in the following uh, slides here. But you can also learn about these and the Call for Code for Racial Justice projects through uh, this the Linux Foundation website or through uh, the GitHub organization directly. So uh, we do have a really amazing new project in there uh, in the Call for Code ecosystem. It didn't come as a global challenge winner, but it was amazing technology that was being deployed in Mexico and Chile by a startup called Grio. And so what Grio did was they analyzed how you can provide earthquake early warning to communities that aren't uh, in the global north. They're, they're, they're very rich folks that can afford billion dollar national earthquake early warning systems like Japan, parts of the US, Mexico. And what they did was they created a way to, um, to democratize early warning technology by creating low cost sensors with high quality uh, components uh, that can uh, gather information like an accelerometer in your phone, XYZ data on a re regular basis that can be emitted to the cloud. And once a consensus algorithm is run between these IoT devices, uh, the cloud can determine, yes, that's not a false positive, um, and not a certain number of devices confirm that there is a potential earthquake, send the alerts. Um, so they've done some great testing on the technology. Uh, it, favors, it favorably compares to some of those national networks in, in Mexico, um, but it's now open sourced as the Open EW project. Um, so the community can get involved in understanding how the hardware pieces come together, as well as contributing to those detection algorithms run in the cloud, and also build applications that can consume that data uh, and create new alerts in different ways or integrate them into existing mobile applications. Um, so there's uh, the there's a initiative underway right now um, in Puerto Rico, uh, working with 90 of these sensors. There was an announcement just yesterday, President Clinton of the Clinton Global Initiative uh, talked a bit about this initiative underway with scientific research institutions in Puerto Rico, Grio the startup and the Linux open source project uh, that powers it all behind the scenes. So uh, look out for those announcements. And um, there's there's been a great community around this project already. Um, within the technical steering committee itself, uh, we've got a set of independent developers, we've got seismologists, IBM is there, Facebook is one of the TSC members, and uh, it's a growing community of folks who are um, improving the technology, helping develop uh, the citizen scientist networks behind this, as well as um, some of the um, the national um, networks that uh, might want to take part in this, either in an academic sense or uh, to set one up as an option for their own earthquake early warning system uh, within their particular location. Uh, if you go to openew.com, uh, that'll give you um, great details on the project, how you can join the Slack community there, 
And of course on GitHub, you can take a look at the code right now and learn more about the sensor versions being deployed in Puerto Rico as we speak. Uh, and I'll take a look at two other um, projects. Uh, another one that is in a similar domain as Agrily. So whereas Agrily focused on uh, getting information to farmers, driving things from the cloud, uh, being software-based, uh, Liquid Prep is one that's with the Linux Foundation right now. Uh, it emerged from an internal call for code competition for IBMers. And this one has been tested. Uh, it was the 2019 internal winner. Um, and this one's been tested in a field uh, in India, as well as through some partners in Canada. And they have an open source community that includes the Central New Mexico Community College that has developed additional types of sensors that can be used to inform a, a farmer uh, what their current soil conditions are, uh, what the upcoming weather uh, for, uh, uh, portends, and how whether they should water today, how much they should water today, based on bringing all this information together. Um, so there's uh, lots of great testing going on right now, uh, lots of organizations involved, and always looking for, for new partners to help improve this technology around the world with different institutions. Um, so this one is already a Call for Code Project the Linux Foundation, um, and you can take a look at that, that tech today. And finally, here's a new project. It comes from an organization called Build Change. Uh, it's called Isaac Simo, Intelligent Supervision Assistant for Construction, and it's Spanish uh, translation. Uh, this is one that actually uh, came in as a finalist in one of the global competitions, uh, but they had such promising technology that we continue to want to support what they did in the context of that challenge and bring it into Linux Foundation as something more generic as an open source project. So it is built on an earlier project that was um, created in the context of the earthquake in Nepal in 2015. Um, Build Change is a nonprofit organization that sends out experts in emerging nations um, to assess building quality that may not be up to certain, certain standards um, and to ensure that after a natural disaster, it's still safe to live in. Um, and if not, what the homeowner could do to improve it. So the initial solution behind Isaac Simo was a way to train a model on building types in Nepal to understand based on the window placement, the door placement, other construction elements, and their current level of damage, whether they were safe to go back into, whether they were definitely not safe to go back into and should be destroyed, or whether they should um, get some remediation in terms of uh, retrofitting them with, uh, uh, with steel pillars or, or additional concrete elements. So based on that application that provided homeowners with their own power to, to get those rough assessments up front, the build change team has been working on a solution that is uh, dedicated more, instead of at larger buildings, facades, looking at the construction elements within. So the quality of the rebar, the quality of how a building, uh, a brick wall has been created in terms of the stacking of the bricks and the mortar thickness um, and other things. So really an, an amazing um, data science challenge and also a, uh, another way to use Android devices that folks have um, ubiquitous devices around the world. And so what Build Change is now trying to do is based on the context of Nepal and Colombia where they operate is create a generic framework for folks around the world uh, to use this technology as a way to train and deploy their own models for building quality. So in the United States, we have certain types of building um, conditions and standards. Uh, in Europe, they're different, in Africa. And so by creating a framework where anybody can train and upload their models, the build change team can also validate the quality of those models and certify them, as it were. Um, these things can be created as a ecosystem of trained models, and also um, folks can create their own version of the Android application uh, and deploy something for their local uh, environment. So uh, keep on the lookout for this one. Uh, this is an amazing project. We've been working with um, the Bill Change team uh, for about 18 months to, to bring this to the state that it's in. So with that, I hope um, you're inspired about the great technology that's there already. But as I mentioned, we are starting our fourth year of the global competition, uh, which again is going to be focused on climate change. And if you're, you're really inspired by the solutions that have been created, I think this is a great way to learn about those, contribute to them, 
meet those teams in the open source community that we have through Call for Code, uh, and also build your own skills. So if you want to learn about data science, if you want to learn about visual recognition, training and machine learning models, learning about IoT mesh networks, learning about sensors and um, data science of uh, calculating averages over time, there's a lot of great tech out there already um, that you can learn from. And we also want folks to take part in this year's competition, build their own amazing stuff, leveraging potentially some of that Linux Foundation technology that's there, or using additional projects like Kubernetes that are also hosted at the LF uh, or um, other technologies dedicated to agricultural situations, for example, as with the AgStack uh, Foundation, which was just announced earlier this month. So uh, meeting the ecosystem, learning the tech and getting involved. So the theme this year, again, is climate change as it was last year. We have a specific focus on the um, three sub themes within climate change. So you can build an application um, for climate change generically, or you can look at the starter kits for three themes that we um, validated with folks at the United Nations and public and private partners in a design thinking workshop we did ourselves around understanding a potential technology solution to clean water and sanitation, which is grounded in sustainable development goal number two, around zero hunger, which is in sustainable development goal number six, or responsible production and green consumption, uh, SDG number 12. So uh, what we try to do through Call for Code is bring experts together so you can understand these important issues, how they measure success in terms of what needs to be achieved by 2030, as well as have a look at a potential use case and solution on how you use IBM and open source technology to create the seed of your submission for the competition, which we want to support as a sustainable open source project at the Linux Foundation if you've won the competition. So uh, take a look at that. We've got a lot of training. There's some on-demand materials around the competition, uh, things like that. I see we do have a question about the, um, the Call of Code application and deadline. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but it is a multi-month global competition and you have plenty of resources. You've got folks that you can, um, that you can uh, leverage for help in the competition. So uh, four steps to get involved. We have a community um, in the IBM developer um, uh, website. Uh, this will get you access to free technology to build your solution. Uh, we've got lots of tutorials on the IBM cloud, which in turn is built on a lot of Linux Foundation open source technology, which includes the CNCF projects um, and other projects from Apache and Eclipse Foundations as well. But a lot of great open source there that you can consume as a service. You'll have access to $200 in credits uh, with the new account for six months. And um, we've got access to um, those starter kits. As I mentioned, they're in the Call for Code GitHub organization as well. There's videos, there's architecture diagrams, uh, there's lots of tutorials to get a feel for um, how you would build a solution. Uh, in Slack, you can find team members. You can reach out to mentors like myself who can help you understand open source technology and, and point you at the right experts who might be able to guide your solution. And um, the competition is open until July 31st. So you have uh, just under, not just over two months to build your solution um, and continue from here. And um, even though we launched the competition in March, we opened uh, for participation. Teams like Agrily last year, uh, they waited to the end of the school, the school year at Pace University, which is about this time, to start working on the solution. So even if you haven't gotten started, plenty of time to do that. Um, so July 31st is the deadline. Um, there is a, um, a project sample GitHub repository that you can find um, that has a sample of the deliverable we expect. It's a well-documented readme file. It's a crisp um, description of the problem you're solving. It includes a three-minute video and any sort of working code you have today that the judges can use to assess um, whether the solution does what it says. Um, and also a roadmap. So as I mentioned, when Call for Code solutions come in, Folks have only had a few months to work on the projects. We know they're maybe not pr um, production grade yet, but with a roadmap, we can tell how mature the project is and what your grand plans are for it going forward. Uh, maybe assuming you do have funding, maybe you do have contributions from IBM experts to help you bring it forward. Um, so July 31st is when things are due, um, but uh, Call for Code is um, a year-round initiative, we do have a lot of other ways to get involved even beyond the competition period, and of course in the open source communities. So please do um, get involved. Um, 
So with that, uh, let me see if there are any other open questions in the chat. I see that we had some answered ones. Let's see. Okay, let me see the general chat. Um, but if you do have any questions, please drop them into um, either the Q&A area or in the chat in general, and I will get to those. We do often have, we, we do have a frequently asked questions um, uh, page. So if you go to callforcode.org, which is the website for the global competition, that describes the official rules, it describes the bug, grudge, uh, judging criteria. It has a list of judges who are both technical and non-technical um, from organizations. Like we've got Jim Zemlin from the Linux Foundation who judges. Uh, we've got um, President Bill Clinton, who's involved in picking the top five finalists from the semifinalists. Uh, we have technologists, experts all over the world. You can, you can see those folks we have lined up for this year on callforcode.org. And you can also find the FAQ. So it talks to uh, what your IP is. It's all yours, but the submission itself has to be Apache 2 licensed so the judges can evaluate it. And we do want these to live on as open source projects. Um, you can learn about the team member sizes, so maximum of five, minimum of one, you can compete alone. Uh, there's links to the starter kits. Uh, there's links to other potential opportunities for you as a university student to take part. We have additional prizes there. Uh, your university may already be involved, uh, so they may ac have access to additional specific resources. Um, and you can also um, keep, keep in touch with the news and the additional um, things. Okay, I see we have a question in. How many hours per week on average are required uh, to work on these projects? Does it depend on the project perhaps? That's a great question. So the competition itself it spans from, we launched on World Water Day, March 22nd this year. It goes until July 31st um, of this year. So that's a great window to work on your application. And there's really no right answer as to how much time you should spend on it. Um, the judging criteria, one of them is completeness and transferability, but since that's balanced with innovation, usability, and uh, in, in efficiency in what problem you're solving, um, some of it, the time you spend can be just, you're in the flow, you're, you're, zone, you're, you're doing things the last week of the competition, you're creating amazing stuff that's powerful. There are other folks that like to pace themselves more, deliver on two-week sprints from start to end. Um, so I think on average, it can go anywhere from, you know, a couple hours a week to maybe working 40 hours a week, one particular uh, week. And so uh, it depends on the team, how your team works together, the time zones. And there's really no official level of completeness it needs. You're competing with folks from around the world. So the more complete, the better. Um, but uh, the most important thing to leave time for is preparing your, your kind of pitch at the end. And we do a webinar on, on submission best practices, but since you're gonna be sharing your idea with technical and non-technical judges, you wanna make sure in your submission, you've got a well-documented GitHub repo. Uh, you've got a crisp three minute video that talks to um, what you're trying to solve, showing how you're solving it and where you wanna go with it. And also leaving any additional deeper videos or documentation in that repo for the judges to find. Um, there's, a, there's a set of four tips I have. So if you go to callforcode.org slash submit, um, that shows you a video with my four tips. It shows you the submission form of what's required um, so that you can get ahead of that. Um, folks can, you know, your video quality can vary, can be super professional, can be just something you throw together on Zoom that you record yourself talking on. Um, but make sure you, you take a look at some of the projects that have been out there before, learn from those, look at the project sample, um, which is linked from that submit page and, and build your solution. Okay, another question comes from BJ Chowdhury. Is there any computer language barrier? Um, great question. You can use anything you want to build an application for this competition. Uh, as IBM is the sponsor and founding partner, we ask that you use uh, one IBM cloud product or service. So you might use uh, a web application runtime, you might use a serverless function, you might use the weather company APIs, you might um, use a blockchain platform, Kubernetes, Code Engine, anything there. But you can bring in stuff, data sets from elsewhere, um, open source um, projects. Uh, so if you, for example, want to embed a Google Maps API, something like that, you can do that 
if you want to pull in um, data from elsewhere, if you want to build your solution completely, for example, on a local React environment on your computer, uh, just when it's ready for submission, um, deploy that to the IBM cloud, maybe just as a web application, even if it's a static web app. Uh, so that's really the only limitation. And keep in mind that the end goal is sustainable open source projects. So if you're building on something that's um, a really obscure language, you may not have a great audience of people to contribute to it down the road. Um, and so keep that in mind, or if it's uh, a limited access platform, um, we have seen some great mainframe solutions, but um, not everybody has access to a mainframe. So if think about how you're going to deploy your solution if it were to be carrying on as an open source project at the Linux Foundation. Okay, another question from Ori Gruber. Gruber, how can I attend the competition as an observer? It would be helpful to see the candidates and their projects. I work with over a thousand students, 40 faculty as a chief um, uh, uh, technician at uh, CUNY, City University of New York. Great, great to see you. We've been involved with the Borough of Manhattan Community College. Um, and actually we've had um, one of the professors from CCNY um, take part as a judge in the competition in the past. So we definitely have ways for, um, as a observer to take part in the community, you can still register for the competition, join Slack, introduce yourself. Uh, we may be interested in talk to you about being a judge later, or we may invite you onto a webinar, uh, maybe talk about some of the key climate change issues out there. And of course, we'd love for you to share the message uh, to students. Um, so maybe you run a hackathon specifically that targets um, your agricultural college within your university system, things like that. So yeah, we definitely do welcome non-technical folks. As I mentioned, even within the teams, uh, they are helpful to create solutions that are well-balanced and take on a real problem. Uh, the one limitation we do have is um, for prizes, we can't give them to government-owned entities. So uh, faculties of state universities, unfortunately, wouldn't be eligible as a part of a team, but they can mentor their students who are not, not official employees of that university to take part. So I uh, look at the participation agreement carefully if you have any questions around that. Great, okay. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, and I know we're just about ready to wrap up anyway. So let me leave you with some um, closing, um, just some comments. Uh, really to, to learn about Call for Code, um, check out ibm.com slash call for code. Uh, that's where you hear about this year's competition, join Slack, get the invite there. Uh, accept the uh, code of conduct, just like the LF has. And then if you're interested in taking a look at the projects, go to linuxfoundation.org. If you look through projects, look for call for code. You'll see the 12 we have there, as well as links back to GitHub. So I'm really looking forward to contributions that you may have to the community, uh, feedback you may have to make the existing apps better, but also things that you might create that become the next big, great Linux Foundation innovation. Uh, so with that, let me, um, I guess, wrap it up or hand it over to the host. And um, go thank there. you so much to Daniel for his time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars and have a great day. <laughs>